Hey guys, hope you didn't miss me too much. It's been about 20 minutes, but I'm back. And this time I'm here to talk to you guys about web development. Uh, I'm gonna give a talk to you guys, basically explaining data how data flows through your average web application. And then I'm gonna touch on a bit, a bit about how Python and Flask handles this. So first of all, who am I? I'm Kishal Parikh, I'm a student at Rutgers, uh, I'm an evangelist at DigitalOcean, and I'm a web developer on the internet. Plain and simple. This is basically what I'll cover through the next few minutes. What is a web application? I'll tell you all of the what all the all of the buzzwords mean, like HTTP, REST, CRUD, middleware, all the stuff that you like probably took for granted or don't really know or are afraid to ask. Um, I'm going to show you how data flows normally through a web application and how the request response uh, paradigm sort of works. So to help us out with this, I'm going to use the diagram that you see in front of you. Uh, we got a guy out there, the user of your application. We have, he's going to make a request to the application, and the application is going to send back a response. And that's basically what I'm going to go through in the next few minutes. So let's start with the user. Uh, your user is responsible for making a request. He, that can be typing in a URL, putting a, filling out a form online, sending a post request that way, uh, clicking a button on your web page and triggering that to send some kind of request, or he could be on a terminal using curl and just physically sending a request. But in all cases, he'll receive some kind of response from, from the server that he's trying to hit. And he'll display the content or do whatever he wishes with the information that he just got back. And again, this diagram basically shows the physical manifestation of your user is going to be his web browser, his terminal, the applications that he's using to make the requests from, uh, all of the above, basically. So we talked about the user. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the request itself. So requests are made over HTTP. If you don't know what that means, I'm gonna go over it in just a sec. They use the HTTP methods, and typically we use the REST paradigm, and I'm gonna talk about what all of those things are. HTTP is the hypertext transport protocol. Um, it includes a, li a, a list of verbs that we use to uh, basically tag requests and send requests in particular fashions. The most commonly used ones are get, post, put, delete. And those are ones that you've probably all seen in some, in some fashion. The less commonly used ones are trace, connect, options, patch, and there might be like 15 or 20 other ones that we don't really use. Uh, and I'm gonna go over why exactly that is in REST. REST stands for representational state transfer. It's sort of a paradigm for how we use HTTP verbs pragmatically. Example, uh, you send a get request to get a resource, you send a post, you send a delete request to delete that resource, you send a post request to tell the server about a new resource or create a new entry or resource. And that sort of makes sense. And it's sort of how we handle data flowing through web applications, flowing through your web application. Speaking of the application, uh, the application itself is the next thing that I'll be covering. Uh, what is a server? So, when, when I say server, I can be talking about one of two things. I can be talking about the server hardware or the server software. And I'm going to go through the difference uh, in those two things. Uh, it's the place where the application is running, whether it be physical or um, in software. And it accepts requests, sends responses, and there's an idea of a middleware that I'll uh, demystify in a sec. Server hardware. I'm not going to talk much about this. It's the physical machine that the app is running on. My phone can be made to be a physical server. Uh, my computer can be one, like DigitalOcean is, has been known to uh, provide hosting for, provide servers for you. AWS has been known to do this. It's, uh, a server is just a physical machine. It's no different than the computer that you're staring at right now. We can have several programs or processes running on it, and that's what makes it different from this next type of server that I'm gonna to talk to you about. The program that you're actually going to write. We can think of this as the backend for your web application and we call it a web server. Its responsibilities can include talking to databases, keeping state, um, doing whatever your application's internals are meant to do. Uh, and I talked to you about the word middleware. Middleware basically parses and sanitizes, uh, middleware in this case, I'm talking specifically about HTTP middleware, which parses and sanitizes the requests that are made and makes sending responses and parsing all of that data, all the data involved in that process really, really simple. And speaking of, here's the response. The response is generated by the server, and the software server is what I was talking about right there. 
Uh, the types of responses, you can have an HTML page, you can have strings, you can have JSON. There's a lot of different things that you can respond to the user with, and it's up to the user to determine how to uh, interpret that. So uh, for if you send an HTML page to or a GET request that Chrome is, uh, that Google Chrome is doing. Let's actually do that right now. So I'm going to go to Google Chrome. I'm going to go to make things bigger. I realize that didn't make the right things bigger. So I'm going to go to www.google.google.com. So what actually happened was I made a get request to Google to Google.com servers, and it gave me back this HTML page. The HTML page that you can see right here. And there's a lot to this page because Google is sending uh, sending us back a lot of information. But uh, it is just an HTML uh, it is just an HTML page. You can see doc type HTML at the front of it, and there's a bunch of JavaScript and script tags to for tracking information. I'm guessing. But yeah, let's get back to this. In addition to uh, whatever response the server decides to give, a status code is usually also sent. And status codes are categorized in terms of numbers from 100 to 599, where 100 status codes or any status code starting with a 1 is going to be an informational code that the server, that the server sends to the client. A 2XS, a 2XX code is what you actually want. It means success, received, understood. It's um, your best case scenario. That's why 200 OK is a great status code to be sending back. 3XX is a redirect. If your server decided to redirect your client to a different place or different entity, uh, 4XX is 400s and 500s are where the errors start getting pretty intense. 4XX errors are client error detected, and 5XX errors are server error det detected. So if you ever have worked in the industry and had Nagios bugging you about all the 400s you're getting or 500s you're getting, uh, you can absolutely sympathize with how business critical not minimizing the amount of 400s and 500 errors that you're getting is to you. And so you have a web application. The user makes a request, uh, the request is handled, and a response is sent back. So let's take a break from this presentation to write some code. I'm going to show you a really simple example in Python and Flask, and then we're going to come back and tie things together at the end. Cool. So this is a very simple Flask application. It's less than 10 lines of actual code, not including white space. And there is two things that are going on here. There is a get request and a post request. Methods equals post. Cool. Ooh, that was bad. Caps lock was on. Never turn caps lock on when you have Vim. It gets really mad at you, like really, really mad at you. So what, what this is doing in particular is I'm going to lay it out in the exact same way I laid it out for you in the presentation. So this is our server right here off to the side. I'm going to open tmux to make things easier. Uh, make things smaller. Cool. So you see I have code up here and I have uh, just a terminal window down here just to make things easier for us. And we have our user, our brave user is this Chrome window on the left side of the screen. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be making requests to the uh, code you see in the top right hand corner of the screen. And I'm going to be running it right here in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So I'm going to be running, running this example, and as soon as I go to, it's telling me to go to http colon slash slash 127.0.0.1. I'm going to call, uh, port 5000. And the requested URL was not found because I that doesn't exist, and it's actually .get. So cool. What happened there? Uh, let's, let's go really slowly. So the user typed in a URL or a GET request into their URL bar, they hit enter. And as soon as you hit enter, it travels over the wire and it uses the HTTP protocol to find its way to our server here, who has a record of it. So check out, if you, could, if you guys can see what I'm highlighting right now, uh, this last log line tells us that a GET request was made, 
HTTP version 1.1, and a 200 status code was returned. And on top of that, our web browser also got the code get, got, also got the string get back. And that makes sense. So let's do something different. Let's say, let's make a, instead of returning get, let's return, welcome to local hack day. Super excited about that. Um, and now we're going to make this request one more time. And we have welcome to local hack day. So we went through how to make a get request and how to uh, get, get the response back from the user. And again, I'm just going to bring you back to this diagram because our user made the request, he, our user made the request, it went to our server, the server software that's running, and the server software returned a response to the user himself. And in this case, again, Chrome is the user and the, ser the terminal window on the right-hand side of the screen is the server, is the web server and the uh, server-side code. Cool. So I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to show you guys how a post request works. And so I can curl dash x post, and I'm going to post to 127.0.0.1 slash colon 5000 slash post. And if you see what happened right there, I making this bigger so everyone can read it. Uh, I sent a post request and I got a post back. And that's exactly what I was expecting from, from this application. Because if you if we go back to wow, this is on the size. Anyway, so we go back to this, and what we are expecting is if we make a post request, we will get back the string post. So again. Nothing fancy is going on here. There's probably 10 lines of code like in this entire sample application that I have here in front of you. And we're making get requests, we're making post requests, and we're returning data back to users. Additionally to this, we can, we can get fancy. We can start writing HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We can have forms on the web page to have them submit. But the underlying thing that you have to understand is everything is done over HTTP. And this is how you deal with the, the request response kind of structure that you're used to dealing with. If I go to www.facebook.com, I'm making a get request to Facebook servers, and they're returning back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And nothing, nothing fancier than that is happening right there. Which leads me back to, again, um, in about... 30 seconds after I finish this talk, I'll push that code up to uh, GitHub, and the, the slides that you're seeing right now are already up there. So it's github.com slash kishal, my first name, slash local hack day. Conclusion, web development isn't that complicated. At least the basics aren't. The data flow is simple. The request response structure is pretty easy to understand. Uh, I have a couple suggestions for you guys. Use tools and frameworks and ask for help. You have mentors here, you have people that are very willing to help you, please reach out. If you're ever, you shouldn't be stuck for longer than a few minutes on anything. If you are, please do yourself a favor and ask for help. There's no shame in that. Here's some helpful links. While writing this talk, I went to all of these links, so they might help you at some point. There's flask.poco.org. It's just the Flask API and some notes about that. There's uh, the HTTP if you want to know more about that. All of the status code, so I mentioned there are 1 through 500s. Uh, if you wanted to know a 404 file not, or 404 not found, or 200 OK, or any of the crazy status codes that we have out there. And here's more information about REST as well. There's just a couple links. If you, need, if you have any questions, please contact me. Uh, my name's Kishal, again. I'm kpreek at digitalocean.com or do.co, either one works. Uh, Twitter.com slash cashbagel and github.com slash kishal, my first name. The end. Thanks for listening, guys. And again, happy hacking and have an awesome local app.